Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, year one of Internet Delivered Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Public Safety Personnel. Before I introduce today's presenter, I want to go through a few housekeeping notes. You are all in listen-only mode. This is to limit the ambient noise and feedback during the presentation. Today's session is being recorded. Everyone will be sent a copy of the recording, so if you miss something, you can watch it again. Some organizations do block the GoToWebinar launch window, so you might have sound or visual issues. We suggest joining uh, by phone if those issues persist. We, have, uh, we will have time at the end of the session for questions. Please use the questions box to ask your questions and I will present them to the panelists. We have included handouts, which should be available on your control panel. Instructions for download have been included in the chat window. These bilingual materials provide information on PSPNet and the basics of what they've learned so far. We want to let you know that our presenter has lots to cover today, so it's possible that the session will go over the scheduled hour. If you're not able to stay but have a question, please be sure to submit it, and we will answer, try to answer as many questions as possible so you can view the answers on the recording later. I also want to let you know that though the session will be given in English, we do have today with us Dr. Amélie Fournier to answer any questions in French, so please feel free to submit in both languages. Now, let me introduce our presenter for the day, Dr. Heather Havitis-Dropoulos, who is going to be uh, presenting on PSPNet. Thank you for being here today, Heather. Thank you. Before we start, we did want to do a quick poll of how the audience is caring for their mental health. So let me just bring that up for you here today. All right, so uh, we want to know, do you do something, or sorry, do you feel you do something for your mental health each day? So go ahead and answer that question, and I'll give you a minute. All right, so I'll give you another 30 seconds or so to answer. All right, so it does look like most of you have answered, so I'm gonna go ahead and close that, and then I'll share the results with you. So it looks like that 51% of you do do something every day uh, to help your mental health. 12% of you say no, and 37% say I try, but sometimes life gets in the way. So I guess we have uh, a good uh, answers from our audience, and it looks like the majority of them are doing something for their mental health every day, which is great. So now I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Heather to begin her presentation, and hopefully you will see that sharing box there, Heather, because it takes a second. There we go. And now, how do I see which box is being shared? So it looks like right now we're seeing your notes and the notes page, so I think we probably just need the other screen. there oh yeah perfect good okay now thanks for your patience everyone while i figure out how to set this up oh okay well thank you for coming um it's been a very busy year, and I do have a lot to share, so I apologize in advance if I take quite a bit of time. Um, I'm also gonna try not to talk too fast, which is sometimes what I do when I have a lot to say. So before I begin, uh, I want you to help yourself to some virtual cake. <laughs> if it wasn't for COVID, um, we'd definitely be having some cake to celebrate all that's been accomplished in the past year. Um, and I would be saying some thank you. So um, why don't you just take a big slice of cake that's calorie free and while you enjoy that cake, I'll say a few thank yous to everybody who's helped out this past year. It's definitely um, many people to thank. Um, on behalf of 
the entire SIPCERT and PSPNet team, we really want to say thank you to Public Safety Canada for letting us do this work. Uh, it's really a pleasure to work on this project and I know that everybody on the team feels the same way. It's a, a privilege to, to do that work. Um, I also need to thank the online therapy unit and uh, Macquarie University who really helped us out getting um, off the ground and provided the foundational work for PSPNet. And importantly, I really want to thank um, all of our stakeholders who've contributed to the development of this service and also have been really spreading the word about PSPNet. Um, so that's a lot of different groups who've been participating in this and I hope some of you are on the line um, and you know really thank you for all the effort uh, that you're putting in. We actually know from um, PSP who come to us that they hear about us in various ways and 55% say that they've heard about us through the employer or a co-worker or union so we know that you're doing a lot of work. 19% um, actually, interestingly, are hearing about us through family or friends. And 13% um, from healthcare providers and 11% from peer support. Um, on that note, um, if you are on the line and um, you would like to share information about PSPNet, our, our team is very happy to provide you with any materials or do a presentation or write a newsletter. Um, so please just reach out to us and um, we'll we'll get in touch. It's really important. Um, I think as I've said before, we can build the service, but if we don't get the word out, we can't, we can't actually help people. I also um, really want to acknowledge all of the PSP who've already signed up for our service. So, so far we've actually had over 200 clients who participated in a telephone screening and over 188 who subsequently enrolled and 122 who finished the treatment program and then taken the time to provide us with feedback on how we're doing. And so we're really pleased with um, all of the people who've participated. I think it's actually really interesting to see that we're getting good representation from multiple sectors and um, of course, we've had more people from Saskatchewan than Quebec, but we only launched in Quebec in the fall. And so we're seeing that uh, momentum really building now. Uh, have lots of diversity in terms of um, uh, client participation. So really wanna thank those groups as well. Okay, so I'm gonna just start by telling you a personal story and the personal story does have a point <laughs> to it. Um, but um, as like most people, I've had occasion to need some help from public safety personnel in the past. Um, this story is an oldie, but a goodie. Um, so about 17 years ago, uh, in the Hedges Devropolis household, we started having, um, you know, a, kind of a lovely peaceful day. One of those days, actually, that mothers and fathers like to have. Um, my husband was at his desk doing some work and my son had actually pulled up beside him and was doing some of his homework um, right beside him. So it was a very pleasant moment. But the next thing we knew is that this pleasant moment turned into a state of panic with my son um, lying on the floor screaming in excruciating pain. I can smile about this now, but uh, at the time it really was, um, you know, a, an upsetting event. What had happened was um, my husband has a tendency to lean back in his chair and my son actually probably modeling his dad uh, leaned back and stuck his toe uh, in the lifting mechanism of the chair. And then when my husband adjusted his position, my son's left toe was caught in the chair. So the next thing we knew, he's lying on the floor, uh, screaming, uh, mommy and daddy, I don't think I'm gonna make it. He's, I don't think he'd ever experienced anything like that. Um, very quickly we realized we could not get this chair off my son's toe and my son's toe was like flat as a pancake and he's like panicking. Um, so we called 911 and um, I was concerned actually for something like this, like a toe, that it would take quite a bit of time, but in fact, they came very quickly. 
and a fireman came in with one of his enormous cutting tools and cut that chair off my son's toe. Uh, when this happened, um, the toe came out, like I said, like flat, like a pancake, but it did recover. It's still a little bit flatter than it should be, but it did recover. So why am I telling you this story? Well, ultimately, in our time of need, it took us little time at all to know that we needed help. So now contrast this though, when we experience mental health problems, it takes us a long time between the time that we realize that we might need help and the time that we actually reach out for help. Um, there's no such immediate reaction to go for help. And for some people, actually that time between when you need help and you call for help, they never, they never actually do call for help. It just never comes. And my hope today with this talk is to give you as much information about PSPNet that will interest you in this. So if you are a PSP yourself, that you would reach out for help if you're in Saskatchewan or Quebec, or if you are not, that you would actually consider referring somebody to this service. So my desired outcome is that you're gonna check out and share information on PSPNet. Fundamentally, what we're trying to do with PSPNet is overcome barriers to care. And so what we know with PSP is that uh, mental health problems are prevalent uh, due to the nature of their work. It puts them at increased risk of having problems. And unfortunately, for many reasons, PSP um, don't get access to care in a timely manner. So things like stigma can ha have a barrier, be a barrier, having limited time, of course, living in rural or remote locations. And PSPNet is really designed to be set up in such a way that it overcomes those barriers. There's another barrier actually that's really important that PSPNet is designed to overcome and that I wanna just spend a few minutes talking about uh, because I think it's particularly relevant to PSP. And this is the barrier that um, of, of self-management. So according to some research actually, that desire to self-manage is the number one barrier to getting help. And um, I think it's actually maybe even more prominent in PSP. It's almost like it's um, a blueprint of the profession or something that attracts PSP to this profession is to be independent and self-sufficient. And actually I think it's a very important quality to have and one that we want people to have long term. Um, it's really helpful for managing mental health. At the same time, when problems are highly distressing, they're creating disability, so they're creating problems maybe at work or at home, um, interfering with sleep, they're prolonged or you have multiple problems, that desire to self-manage is a huge barrier to getting help. And um, what happens in the end is that because you're trying to self-manage, um, your uh, the attempts to work on mental health kind of get interrupted when you're self-managing and you have higher problems. So without support, um, it's not like it's not possible to work on mental health, but working on mental health can be quite choppy. It's like start and stop. And it can feel quite disorganized and clients talk about it just being really unpleasant not to have a systematic plan of attack. And so PSPNAT is really about creating this different doorway. It's not that the other doorways are not important. They are. All of these doorways are important. But it's about creating this different doorway that acknowledges that we have these barriers like time and location and this desire to self-manage and try and create a method that overcomes those barriers. And the way that we do this is that we put the information that would normally be shared in face-to-face -face treatment online in an easy to review format. Um, it's very organized, it's spread over time, it can be conveniently accessed. And we put that online in a way that allows you, if you really want to self-manage, that you can be much more in control of your care. But we also do pair it with some therapist support so that that therapist support is available to you if you need it. 
Um, most commonly, that's in the form of once a week care, either by phone or by email exchanges. Actually, email exchanges would be the most common one. But that uh, level of support can be dialed back. So, you know, you can have less support. You can work on those materials and only reach out when you want to, if at all. Um, or you can get more support if you're going through a really difficult time. What we're doing is really having this flow or process for working on mental health. And in part, what we're doing actually is when you sign up, it's like a commitment device. It helps you follow through and makes that process of working on your mental health just easier. Not, not, it's not completely easy. I'm not going to say that. So it does take time. Um, clients at least are spending one hour a week, sometimes several hours a week. In terms of how this actually works, it's um, quite a simple process. You have to first create an account on PSPNet. Um, you then go through and you complete an online screening questionnaire that gives us some background information on what your concerns are and allows us to determine whether it's a good fit for you. There's then a telephone screening process that can take a variable amount of time. After that, if it is a good fit, which most clients are, clients are signed up for this online course. It's usually eight weeks, but it can be extended, which we found is really important for PSP just given the nature of their work. And then at the end of treatment, um, you filling out questionnaires again, and we help decide whether we would refer you to another service, which in most cases we don't, but occasionally we do. I should mention that as part of the telephone screening process, an important role that we play as well is that for some clients who it doesn't seem to be a good fit for, then we'll try and help you find something that would be better for you. In terms of skills we cover in PSPNet, it's based on cognitive behavior therapy, which I think lots of people will be familiar with, but it's really a structured skills-based treatment that's focused on how we think and on our actions. And um, the reason that we focused on this is that there's a lot of evidence for CBT from face-to-face -face literature, as well as from ICBT literature. There's actually more than 300 studies that have been done on ICBT. And it's not like, other things don't work. We know other things work as well, but we just have a lot of evidence for this and it really lends itself well to an online delivery format. What we're doing is helping clients build these cognitive and behavioral skills that we think are like building blocks to mental health. Um, fundamental about ICBT is that we're working on these cognitive and behavioral habits and really what we're wanting to do though is create an enduring mental health habit, habit so that it, on an ongoing basis that people are noticing and modifying thoughts and behaviors. So it's not like you do this and then you never do this again. It's actually more like a long-term strategy. And the goal then is that you, you develop these strategies and then these particular strategies can ground you during times of stress. Um, I should mention that for some clients, they've had CBT before. They might know a lot about CBT. And in this case, what they're doing, it's kind of like a reminder or refresher. There's other clients that have heard about it. So they've learned about it through like mental health awareness. And for them, it's helping them take that knowledge that they've heard about and put it into action. And uh, still for other clients, it is new, and some of the strategies might be new. So let me just say a little bit more about um, what happens when you enroll in PSPNet. So first of all, we currently in Saskatchewan have two courses. Uh, right now in Quebec, we have the one course, the wellbeing course, but uh, we'll soon have the PTSD course as well. Um, as you can guess, uh, the wellbeing course is actually a general course that's designed to help you with diverse mental health challenges, so anxiety, depression, social anxiety, also trauma. And then the trauma course is really hones in on PTSD. And uh, that decision about which course to go into is a bit of a collaborative process based on the screening that you go through. 
And um, so, so far we found that most clients are picking the well-being course collaboratively with the telephone screener, um, but that could change. We actually only started to offer the PTSD course uh, in, it's only been for about six months. So as knowledge of that grows, it could be that that could grow as well. In general, one of the reasons that we think that clients are picking the well-being course is that we really know from PSP that they have very diverse symptom concerns. So um, as this graph shows, 62% of our clients actually have more than one mental health concern. So anxiety and depression or anxiety and trauma, for instance, which would make this appropriate. Um, and then the top two concerns are actually, well, depression is the top concern and then generalized anxiety the next. So it makes sense why um, the well-being course is more prominent right now. So it's not that trauma doesn't happen, but there's a lot of other things that clients are describing during the ICBT course. So general stress of the job is enormous, sleep issues, uh, problems with physical pain, uh, overwhelming workload, uh, stress related to COVID-19 right now, um, all makes, helps us sort of explain why that well-being course is so important. So in terms of treatment, how treatment works, it really is like taking an online course if you've ever done that. So each of our courses, whether it's the well-being course or the PTSD course is set up with five core lessons and providing clients this systematic approach for working on their mental health. In addition to that, we have a lot of additional strategies on the side. I think it's kind of interesting what we found over the past year about which strategies are used. So, I mean, all of them will be opened um, to some extent, but the top ones are um, definitely working on relationships with significant others, uh, anger, communication skills, problem solving, and worry. Um, so what happens with each lesson is there's material that's presented. It's very easy to read, it's engaging. Um, along with the core materials and the strategies that we describe, there's a lot of examples that are included, so stories of PSP, and um, there's homework. So after each lesson, you're given some strategies that we ask you to sort of practice during that week or the next couple of weeks. The PTSD course is really the same format, but again, it hones in on trauma and then there's a few extra strategies that are included as well. So it's beyond the time I have available to go into every strategy uh, that we talk about, but I just did want to say a few things about some core strategies that are taught within um, this lesson, because I think it's helpful that sometimes people don't really understand what we would be teaching. So the first lesson is really about recognizing patterns between stressful events and what's experienced emotionally. So for some clients, this is pretty easy for them to realize. Um, that, you know, how their, what their emotion, how they describe their emotions and how it's linked to their stressor, but for some it can be more challenging. Ultimately, what we want to have clients do in this particular lesson, though, is to recognize that when you experience emotions, it's actually made up of um, physical sensations, your thoughts, and your behaviors. So whether you're experiencing depression, anxiety, trauma, anger, whatever it is, that you can usually break down your, your emotions into those three component parts. And the reason that that's so important is that by breaking it down into those component parts is it actually gives you an opportunity to work on each of those components. Often what clients find when they're breaking their emotions down into these parts is that some of the things that they're experiencing are helpful and some are not helpful. And it's really about taking the time to reflect and think about um, what, what's, what's helpful with, that's going on here and what's not helpful and maybe I could modify. Uh, so just to give you a brief example, so most of the PSP talk about some stress or work, diverse, very, very diverse. So sometimes it is about um, getting called out Sometimes it's about testifying in court. 
Um, other times it's about interactions with colleagues or superiors, or sometimes interactions with clients or the public. Um, and so what they're doing there is spending some time thinking about, okay, so there's a stressor that's happening, I'm having an emotional reaction, but what are the component parts of what's going on here? This part, sometimes people want to just jump through and get on to um, just, I, okay, I want to work on those thoughts then right away. But we really do want people to take the time to uh, think about this and sort of think about um, what what those thoughts are. They can be um, automatic thoughts that are kind of entrenched and hard to identify. Um, what are the what are the prominent physical sensations that you're experiencing and what are the behaviors? This to me is a little bit like, um, I don't know if you know this show, this is, might be dating, I don't even know if it's still on the line, but um, Clean Sweep. Uh, so in Clean Sweep, what they do, they would do is uh, go through somebody's house and sort things into different areas of things to keep, things to throw away, and then uh, things to give away. And in this case, it's kind of like clean, clean sweep for the mind, um, but we're putting things into piles of, okay, what's good about what I'm doing? Because there will be good things. And then what are the things that I might wanna work on and modify? So in lesson two, we really delve into the thoughts. When I worry, and when I talk about this, I worry I might sound a little bit Make, make it sound very simple, but it's not simple at all. This can be really quite difficult because as I said, the thoughts can be so automatic and become very entrenched. Um, but the basic concept here is that our thoughts matter. I really like this quote, that um, they can be our greatest asset, but also our worst enemy. Uh, another way to look at this, which maybe resonates with some PSP, is that thoughts, are the things that can put fuel on a fire or help put a fire out. So if that fire is stress, our thoughts can increase our stress or they can decrease our stress. So what clients can expect when they work on this lesson is to really hone in on those thoughts and take a close look at um, whether there's some that might need to be modified. Um, what we do in the lesson is we provide a lot of examples, but it's really up to the PSP to take a look at their particular thoughts and know which ones are relevant to them. Another way maybe simplistically to look at this is um, what we're doing is helping clients identify sort of old thoughts or patterns um, that are prominent to question them. And there's a process that we're teaching about how you question thoughts and then formulate new thoughts. And then what we ask is um, try it, like put that into play, experiment with it and see if it makes a difference. So in that process, what you might find is it doesn't, it didn't work, then you keep going. Uh, it could be that it works once, but long term, it doesn't work. And so then you have to keep going. So again, it, what's most important here is that you're learning a process that's helpful to you long term. I have a few examples here. And just because of time, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll have them up on the screen and you can kind of read through um, to see what I mean. I'll just maybe talk about um, the top one. So imagine um, a PSP who's at work. So this, this thought is actually not that uncommon for uh, whether you're corrections or police or fire, which, whichever area you work in, this feeling that I need to suck it up, like just not, not let this bother me and I need to just do my job. And um, basically what happens through this process is we would ask the PSP to really kind of like look at that thought and then challenge that thought and ask yourself some questions. So some examples of questions might be, okay, well, is that helpful? It, how is that helpful? When is that helpful? Um, is there actually something that's not helpful about that particular thought? A very good thought that we, or question that we find that's helpful for clients is to think, um, what would, I um, would my coworker tell me to this to do this? Would is that what they would consider would be a good thought to have? Um, would my 
family or friends want me to have that thought? Would I actually recommend that thought to family and friends? Ultimately, through this process of asking questions, what we want the client to do is to come up for, with an alternative thought that's more helpful to them. And again, what one person comes up with after that process could be very different from another. And what's helpful for one might not be helpful for another. So it's really about tweaking and experimenting to see what works for you. But an, ex an example of an alternative thought might be, so, okay, so if I suck it up, um, it's actually just gonna leak out and it's gonna come out in the form of irritability and anger. and I actually need to take time to work on my mental health, just like I would work on my physical health. So just gives you a brief example of um, what uh, an unhelpful thought might be and how you would use questioning to come up with a helpful thought. I could probably spend the whole hour on this, so I'm just gonna pass through, but during the question period, if you wanted to um, follow up on any of these, just let me know. So what we're doing in ICBT is um, describing this process and then providing a lot of examples. Some will resonate with clients. Some clients, I'll be honest, will tell us that, that that didn't help me. And that's actually why the therapist is also really important. So if there's things that are on there and it's not resonate, resonating with you and you're needing help, that therapist is there to assist you. Um, some clients actually do this whole program and they don't tell us what their thoughts are and that's actually completely fine with us. Um, what, what's most important is that clients are going through the process and taking away what they want. If they want our help, we're there for them, but if they don't, we're okay with that. Um, I would also like to say that what's really important that some people will actually do this work on the computer and other people would do this just sort of more in their mind. Um, and still others uh, might be doing it in a diary um, point form or whatever like there's no there's no like you don't have to be sitting on the computer to do this what's really important is that you take the time to do that that you kind of approach it with honesty um, with recognizing that some thought that you're having might be so entrenched that they're difficult to look at and and basically with patients what we're hoping is over time that that process becomes more spontaneous and kind of a lifelong skill that you would use so in addition to talking about thoughts um, in this course, of course, it's called CBT. So we also do focus on behaviors. Again, just like thoughts, what we do has the ability to put fuel on that fire or to put the fire out or dampen that fire. <clears throat> And again, it might sound like it's easy, but that process of actually looking and taking a close look at your behaviors and trying to figure out what's helpful and what's not helpful can be quite a difficult process. Um, and just because for the very reason that we're inclined to do the things that we've always done and making change is tough. The more we've done something, the more entrenched those behaviors become. And it's harder to see that they might not be helpful. I had another example up there of alcohol. Um, it's not, not all PSP, but definitely it is a strategy that some PSP use and it feels like it's the strategy that really helps um, relax you. And it's part of this process could be looking at that as um, trying to check out, is that actually helpful or not helpful? Um, so within the course, we provide a lot of examples. <clears throat> Again, some resonate and some don't, and the therapist is there to kind of help you explore if you want that. Sometimes actually what's most problematic for clients is not what they're doing, but what they're not doing. So um, avoidance um, behaviors or isolating behaviors. So avoiding certain locations, people or events, or even avoiding emotion itself, or isolating from family and friends. In terms of behaviors, again, so what we're doing is take a close look, um, really hone in and say, okay, what's working and what's not working? We typically ask clients to start small, um, and we think that small behaviors are actually really important, that small behaviors are the gateway to larger behaviors. And we can't really underestimate the value of those small behaviors. It, 
it can be tough to break down the behavior that you really want to do into these small pieces, but it, it's really, really essential and it, and it takes uh, patience and persistence. Um, and so lots of clients actually want to like jump into something. Um, so say they've not been doing any socializing, they've been really isolating from family and friends, and then they really recognize that, okay, this is actually not that helpful and I want to spend more time with family and friends. And then they go full steam ahead on that and it's too much too soon. And um, so it's really about just slowing things down. The other thing actually that we find is that sometimes the behaviors don't change, but instead what change is the approach to that behavior. So for example, uh, we do find like there's a lot of clients who will be doing lots of great activities to manage stress. And on the surface, it might feel like those great activities are really working you know, to manage stress. But what's missing though, is really being present in the moment and actually taking the time to benefit from the activities. And so again, it can be that what we're tweaking is not the activities themselves, but the process of how you're approaching. I don't, I've said this so many times, but there's no blanket behavior. You're not signing up for this course and we're not gonna say do A, B, C, and D and you'll be fine. It's about figuring out what works for you. So there's some other points that I really need to um, uh, bring up that I think really make PSP import, PSP net important. So first of all, it's free. Um, second of all, there's no referral needed. It's uh, private from your employer. If you ask us to reach out to a healthcare provider, we will do that. Um, but typically there, is, there isn't a lot of contact. It, it would be a single service. It does start with an assessment and it's not like a whole detailed assessment. If you're a PSP and you've been through and worked with a psychologist before, it's not as extensive as some other assessments, but it does involve collecting some information that's helpful for us to figure out whether this is a good fit or not. It's interesting that about 6% of clients who go through that process actually decide they're fine and they don't actually need to do this right now. And it's just helpful for them to know that. Still about 3% of our clients, we do end up referring on to another service. Um, we do ask for a medical provider as an emergency contact, and it's important for us for a few reasons, although we don't use it that often, but you have to recognize that the clients that we're working with, many have very significant concerns, and we want to be in a position to best help clients. So for example, almost 40% of our clients tell us that they are taking medication, and uh, many are having suicidal thoughts on a regular basis, uh, which makes it important to have that extra contact. Um, also really important, to, as I've talked about before, we have therapist assistance. And um, I think something that's really important about this that makes it different from some other services that PSP may be getting is that all of these Clinicians have been trained, very well trained in ICBT and also have ongoing supervision in working with diverse public safety personnel. And we have access to an incredible resource in SIPSERT and getting information to help us really fully understand PSP. As I said, we offer this varying level of support. The vast majority of our clients, so almost 90%, uh, do take advantage of once a week support, um, but 7% actually go up to to twice a week support. And it's not constant, but they'll have times where they want support more than once a week. And it's only about 4% that um, really work on this completely on their own. And again, um, although clients have therapist support, sometimes that therapist support is very one-sided. So it's a therapist who's reaching out and saying, how are you doing? Is there anything I can help you with? but the client isn't really sharing too much back. In other cases, it definitely is much more like a face-to-face -face relationship that there's a lot of sharing back and forth, but it's variable. The, the program is designed to meet the needs, the individual needs of PSP. Um, I have a couple of quotes here that just give you a sense of the value of that, um, of that therapist support. And I think that they um, just speak very highly of the of the therapist that we have. So 
um, uh, this one client saying, I feel like what I like best about the course were my weekly check-ins with the therapist. And another saying that the therapist was very encouraging and always had a suggestion if they needed one. And the key there is if I needed one. Uh, something else that's really key here is that the, the materials are tailored to PSP. So we took pre-existing materials, but then we spent a lot of time weaving in examples from our stakeholders and from the literature uh, to really help PSP figure out how you apply this to your situation. Um, and uh, again, I just have a few quotes that I think really um, highlight how helpful those examples are. So again, not everybody's going to find them helpful, but it's definitely the case that this comes out as one of the major strengths of this particular program at the end of the treatment when we ask clients what they liked, this is what they tell us. So I found the stories extremely helpful. A reading about cases similar to mine helped me feel less alone and they made me feel more normal. So it's doing two things there. One, giving you ideas and two, it just normalizes what you're experiencing. Uh, something else that is really important about this particular program is that we are evaluating our outcomes over time. So uh, everybody who participates is invited to tell us how they're doing at eight weeks, at six months, and at one year follow-up. So we invite you. You don't have to do it if you don't want to, but um, we ask for your help. And so far, PSP have been just so generous with their time and filling out these questionnaires and letting us know how they've been doing and then also what they liked and what we could improve. Um, so we're, I think we're at about 85% uh, completion rate of our measures at eight weeks, which is really incredible how engaged PSP are in developing this particular service. And I have to tell you that this feedback really does matter. We've made a lot of changes over the past year. So we've added new materials, um, we have uh, modified materials, we've added in examples. Uh, so so for an ex as an example of something that we modified, we took our sleep materials, we really improved them. Uh, we added in more client examples, we added in materials around anger and grief, pain, uh, alcohol change, more materials around COVID-19. In addition to that, we've been continually improving our um, sort of the procedures or technical aspects. So we added in some more video introductions to, to the materials, audios of the lessons, uh, we have graphs. Um, so we really are getting better over time. So now on to the what's happened at one year. You can follow us each month. We update how we're doing uh, on uh, PSPNet. We've had great engagement. So 84% of clients have completed all the lessons and 89% have completed the majority of the lessons. Sometimes people don't complete that last lesson, which is on relapse prevention, um, but the majority like on the cognitive and behavioral initial skills are completed. Great treatment satisfaction. So among these clients, this, this, this was 92% um, uh, that had completed the eight week measures out of the first 117, really high satisfaction levels and increased confidence in using these skills in day-to-day -day life. It means a lot to me that people at the end of this 98% say that was worth my time. Like to give us uh, an hour or more of your week and to feel like that's worth your time, that, that, that means a lot. Um, not only are people satisfied, but we are actually seeing really uh, big and significant improvements in mental health. So first of all, if you came in uh, with a symptom, um, at the beginning, most people don't develop that by the uh, eight-week follow-up. And then also if you came in with that at a clinical level, that people will um, have a significant drop either to a non-clinical level or, or, or like a huge drop from like severe, at least to moderate or moderate to mild. Um, this is this is very good. So one of the areas that we're kind of looking at here is social anxiety. So not as many clients come in with social anxiety, but it does seem to be one of the areas that is not necessarily improving as much as we would like to see it. So we're we're looking at that over time. But in terms of the other areas, we are seeing these big improvements. 
Um, not only are we seeing symptom improvements, but clients are telling us that this is really making a big difference in terms of their functioning. So um, it's helping with relationships with family and friends. They're more able to share with family and friends. And uh, I like this, um, you know, from one client saying, this was a real game changer for me. So coming back to uh, where we started, I think the ultimate success for us is that clients feel that working on mental health is not just a means to an end, but is a reward in and of itself. So it might be described by some as coming up for fresh air when drowning. And coming back to this particular graphic, what we're seeing is that the clients who are participating are telling us that they're having, it's an it's creating this enduring mental health habit. It's not about getting things perfect, it's about practice and that they are being able to use this during times of stress. I've shown this picture before, but I think we've come a long way uh, during this year, but I don't think we're quite at the other side. I'd like to see even more PSP in Saskatchewan and Quebec using our service. Our focus right now really needs to be on outreach, and that's why your participation in this is so important. Uh, we really need your help to get the word out. Like we have a really good service, but if we build this, but we don't share the information with PSP, it's not that helpful. So please um, help us share uh, this information. Um, I should say, I know that there's people on the line who are not from Saskatchewan and Quebec, and please know that we are working on trying to figure out how do we take PSP and ACT to other provinces. So what we have right now is a service that it's been developed. Our big challenge now is to get the funding that allows us to hire the clinicians um, to roll that out to the other provinces. And that includes like um, to do the outreach in the other provinces and then yeah, to have the clinicians to support to support that going to other problems. So, so that's on our work list for this year is um, really costing that out. So on that note, I again, I thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed your virtual piece of cake and um, I'd really be happy to invite any questions. Although I think we have a few um, polls first that we're going to conduct and then we'll take some questions. Yeah, we're going to give you a little break for a moment here, Heather, while people send in their questions, and we're going to ask everyone else some questions first. So uh, first one I'm going to put up here is, uh, how long would you try to manage your symptoms on your own before reaching out for any kind of treatment? And so if you guys want to go ahead and select which one uh, would be your choice, that would be great. Just so we can get some more information on that after that story that Heather shared, right? It's very easy when it's something physical to get help right away, but it's not so easy when it comes to our mental health. I'll give you guys a couple more seconds here. All right, answers are flooding in and we'll just give you five more seconds to submit and then we'll close it off. All right. So it does look like 29% um, of you said that you would uh, manage your symptoms for about a month. 22% uh, said three months. 16% said six months. 31% said greater than a year and 2% said I would never reach out for treatment. So that 31% that's saying greater than a year, you, you, you guys have some stamina for sure with that. Um, just, okay. So we're gonna ask you a, another question here. So if you need uh, mental health services after hearing this wonderful presentation, would you consider ICBT? Okay, 
give you guys about five more seconds here. All right. So it looks like 86% of you said yes. So obviously a very convincing presentation, Heather. 10% of you still said don't know, and hopefully we can answer some of your questions after this and you'll, you'll be moved to the yes column. All right, so next question we have for you is, uh, if you used PSPNet, do you think you would want uh, therapist support once a week, twice a week, no support? Maybe you don't know what kind of support that you'd need. If you want to go ahead and answer that right now. All right, I'll give you about five more seconds to put your answer in. All right, so looks like uh, the majority of you said that you would you want support once a week. Uh, next up was 28% with don't know, which makes sense uh, if you haven't tried a program like this before. And then 9% said that they would want that twice weekly support. I think that highlights how that flexibility and support that comes with the program is really helpful for everyone. All right, we've got one last question for you and then we'll, we'll take your questions. So the last question we wanna ask is, what do you think the best way is to inform public safety personnel that PSPNet is available to them? Because of course, our ultimate goal is to help as many people as possible. Give you about five more seconds here. All right, so it looks like the majority of you overwhelmingly chose uh, workplace with 70%. Next up was social media with 25%, and then a little bit for traditional media and a little bit for healthcare workers. So it looks like it's kind of what we've saw in the results that Heather showed that workplace is one of the best places where you think it's, it's a good idea to hear about the program. All right, so now we are going to move to your questions. Thank you for answering our questions. And let's see what we've got. Okay, so you have one uh, comment is that uh, I'm a nurse in Alberta and the CEO of Nurse to Nurse Peer Support and would love to have this resource for my nurse peers that are across Canada. So I know that you were talking a little bit about expanding to other provinces there, Heather. Um, do you think that's something that will happen by the end of the year or is that something that maybe is a next year thing? Yeah, um, so our funding is actually just for Saskatchewan and Quebec, but what we will have by the end of the year is a full plan of what it would take to go to another province. And the big trick, though, is, um, you know, having another province kind of jump in and fund that um, in terms of the, the cost of actually delivering. Um, so uh, no specific plans are in place right now, but we are developing the information that's needed to help those plans go forward. And I certainly hope I would love to see it by another year, but it's, um, you know, a little bit about out of our control that we give the information and then we hope that somebody will act on that. Okay. Uh, while scaling the program for other provinces, are there considerations uh, to tailor the program to a specific province? Uh, why or why not? Yeah, so one of the things that we did with PSPNet was first we did it in Saskatchewan and Quebec, which gives us some understanding of like a small province. And actually this province previously had ICBT freely available um, to PSP through this other unit that I run, the online therapy unit. So we did it here in a small province and then now we're doing it in Quebec. So giving us, you know, a very large province and a province with a different language. And um, so 
it's kind of early for me to know, like to be, um, to know like how well it's working, it's going to work in Quebec. It seems like the results are looking the same. Um, and I do feel though, like some tailoring to another province needs to happen. And one of the ways that the tailoring has to happen is in terms of, well, even all these PSP organizations are set up slightly differently, um, who they report to, who funds that um, mental health services, our linkages to other services. So there's definitely some work that has to be done. In terms of the actual materials, um, I don't think so. I think between those two provinces that we'll have a lot of information, but we would probably want to build that in is to have, you know, enough you know, in the first year of a rollout in another province to be able to gather information from PSP there to see how it's working and whether any tweaking is needed. But it's basically in that implementation process that it, it has to be tweaked. Um, how it fits with other services, for sure. So, uh, Dr. Fournier, I've put a question in the chat box for you. Hopefully you can see it. I think it's about yes. the, the offering this presentation. Yeah. Yes. Um, Est-ce que cette présentation est mise au point après un an? Euh, est mise au point après un an sera faite en français aussi? Oui, c'est vraiment notre intention là, de pouvoir euh, donner un compte rendu après la première année d'existence euh, du PSPNet au Québec. Donc, c'est euh, tout nouveau encore. On n'a pas beaucoup de, 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 de feedback ou de rétroaction là, des clients. Euh, qui, on, ça commence là, à rentrer, mais éventuellement, là, oui, on, on va mettre au point. On Okay, perfect. I assume that that was we are going to offer this presentation in French later. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they want to know if we will uh, give feedback after one year in Quebec too in French. Yes. <laughs> All right, so another question we have is, um, are nurses included uh, in this PSP group or is it something that you'll be thinking of, of expanding to? Yeah, so that's a little bit out of our control. Um, PSP is defined through our contribution agreement um, and by Public Safety Canada. So currently within that group, it's um, police, um, paramedics, corrections, border services, dispatch, uh, who am I missing, fire, uh, search and rescue, um, some, some other groups, but it, it's prim primarily those groups and not nursing um, as a whole profession. And um, we have had some conversations with uh, nursing and I do feel like they're doing um, like some things uh, independently of PSPNet. I'm not quite sure what that is, but if you were to email um, Nick Carlton, uh, I think would be able to provide some ideas about what they're, like who to contact to find out what they're thinking about specifically for nurses. Um, that's not to say that we don't get some nurses who participate in this program, um, depending on the role that they work in. So a nurse who works in corrections, for instance, or a nurse who might be involved in paramedics or, you know, within yeah so so we definitely sometimes do get nurses but it's because they're employed with a certain employer okay. uh dr fournier i think i've put another question there for you hopefully you can see it oh, could i say one thing about that just one other thing that in saskatchewan um online therapy is covered for free and nurses can access um that service right now through the online therapy unit which is uh, the website address is onlinetherapyuser.ca. Um, so it's definitely available in Saskatchewan. And unfortunately, I don't think there's anything in Quebec right now at this time. Okay. All right, perfect. All right, Dr. Fournier. Oui, um, est-ce possible d'avoir ce soutien du thérapeute en français? Uh, très bonne question, là, si je comprends bien le, le, la question en tant que telle. C'est que la présentation est en anglais aujourd'hui, puisqu'on célèbre l'un an d'existence du PSPNet en Saskatchewan, mais toute la démarche, euh, en tout cas pas pour le, le, le truc de stress post-traumatique, mais pour euh, le bien-être euh, du personnel de la sécurité publique, c'est offert euh, en français. Donc, tout le contenu est en français et euh, le support euh, est fait par un psychothérapeute, euh, membre de l'Ordre des psychologues ici au Québec 
ou euh, membre de, de, du collège, du psychologue de la Saskatchewan aussi, si c'est un, un francophone là, de la Saskatchewan. Perfect. All right. So next question is, um, is the uh, service PSPNet delivered through a traditional website or is there a mobile app as well? Yeah, so it is a traditional website, but it does, um, it's responsive to your phone. So you can use your phone uh, to access the materials. Um, I should also mention, I think that something's really important about the way we developed PSPNet is that when you log in, especially for people who live in rural and remote areas, it's possible to log in and download materials to your phone or to your, to your website to print them off and uh, to use them in that way so that you don't need to be constantly on the app to get the information. Um, and a lot of clients do tell us that they do this in rural and remote areas. And then in addition to that, some clients will work on it and they want to download things. So long term, they have access to these resources that they can use, you know, during times of stress, it's sort of as a reminder of those materials. Um, but yeah, you can use your phone, but it was, it is developed um, as a, an internet intervention. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fournier, I have sent you another question for the French audience. Donc, est-ce que les statistiques d'utilisation provinciale, régionale pourront être éventuellement disponibles euh, pour les organisations de ministères? Oui. Euh, donc, euh, nous, on va, on peut, euh, on, peut, on peut donner des statistiques euh, par groupe, même euh, des secteurs, pour des membres de personnes de sécurité publique. Euh, ce qu'on veut s'assurer, c'est pas pour les organisations en tant que telles pour euh, maintenir la confidentialité. Mais oui, éventuellement, même euh, ces mises à jour continuellement sur notre site web. Donc, euh, il y a des statistiques qui sont euh, intégrées de, euh, aux résultats sur le, le site web. Et euh, par groupe de travail, c'est possible aussi d'avoir de, de, des statistiques éventuellement euh, quand on aura un, un, plus grand, un, un plus grand nombre de, de clients là, qui vont avoir eu recours euh, au PSV Net. Okay, perfect. Uh, next question we have uh, is, um, we have many civilian members in our department as well as PSP. Can they access the service or is it just for specifically for the PSP? So if it's uh, like a clerk working in a police service uh, who might deal with files that are traumatic, can they access it? Yes. Yeah. Um, so we have opened it up uh, definitely to, to that group. Um, and uh, it, it's the case that we have capacity right now. I guess if, if at some point we didn't have capacity, we might have to prioritize certain groups, but right now there, it, it is open for sure. And we recognize that um, it's definitely a, a group that is exposed, um, maybe not in the same way as some PSP, but um, uh, you know, it's, uh, stressful and impacts them and it, the materials are written in such a way that that they would apply. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that social support from family and friends is important. Do you have any resources currently or plans to include the family and friends in these programs? Yeah, so we're we're not funded to work th with them but we one of the things that we've been working on and I think we'll start to offer very soon is a, it is an extra handout so that if a um, PSP is working on this and they want to involve a family member in the treatment program, uh, they are able to sort of share this particular handout uh, with that family member to, so that they could more sort of collaborate on uh, problems together. So that, the family member would not be your client, um, but we definitely would encourage them to speak, uh, you know, and and use that support. Um, so yeah, what, we haven't evaluated that, but we've developed it and we'll implement and then evaluate how that works. Uh, definitely a, a, a clear need there though. And again, in Saskatchewan, if you noticed a family member who's struggling, they could get services through this online therapy unit. Um, and then, in Quebec, uh, right now, 
uh, well, actually, this applies to everybody in Canada. So there is this Wellness Together Canada um, website where clients can access all sorts of information that are designed to help people with mental health. And I would, you could take a look at that for sure. Okay. Uh, do you guys have any plans for making further courses beyond the PTSD course? Yeah, so our, our focus right now is definitely the well-being course and the PTSD course and then developing extra resources that go along with those two courses. Um, and so there's no that we don't have funding for that, but it's something that we're we're thinking of. Um, so, you know, like there's some options, for instance, around uh, chronic pain is a course. Uh, that I have in the online therapy unit or chronic conditions course that could be adapted for PSP. So it help, would help clients focus in on, you know, dealing with physical complaints, which we actually know are very prominent in PSP because of the nature of their work. Uh, so that could be a course. We do have an alcohol course. Um, if somebody wanted to focus in on that, that we could adapt to this particular population. But right now, um, we haven't gone in that direction. It is a longer there's oh there's so much you could do there's <laughs> no sure. shortage of ideas for sure no shortage of ideas just have to find the funds correct yes yeah All right. so one last question for today and then i'm going to wrap it up um so last question is will the uh, on-call app that is in development have access to psp net material so um, I'm not involved in the development of the on-call app and we haven't had any discussions about that as of yet. Um, so I, I'd have to say no, but never say never, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so uh, but yeah. I think that has to develop a little bit more before we you know, have discussions. For sure. And it's possible maybe it's something that could be provided as a link in the app if people wanted the service as well, I, I would think. Mm -hmm. All right, so I am going to wrap it up for today. Thank you everyone for your fabulous questions and for participating in our polls. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know that there were handouts attached, as I said. All of those handouts are going to be put with the recording of the um, webinar on our website. That's the SIPSERT website. Um, I believe they're also available on the PSPNet website, as well as a lot of the other content that you saw today is available in the outcomes and um, research focus on the PSP website. So we hope that you'll take an opportunity to take a look at that. Uh, last thing I just want to do quickly is uh, remind you guys that a survey is going to appear at the end of the town hall. So we hope that you will uh, fill that out for us and provide us that your wonderful feedback. Um, or, or if you have an issue with this, let us know. Um, we also want to let you know that we have a last session in the CIHR PTSI Catalyst Grants presentation. They're coming up on Thursday. And we're having a special webinar next Wednesday, March the 3rd, that will look at the role of reintegration programs in PSP returning to work after a critical incident. I want to thank um, my presenter for today, Dr. Hapish Rapolis, and our other panelists, Dr. Fournier, for being here and answering all your questions. And I want to thank you for coming and giving us your time. So everyone, take care, stay safe, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Great. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes.